We're going to look at Hebrews 6 as our guiding principle for invitations. Uh, we've been doing that for some time, and I remind you of Hebrews 6, verses 1 and 2, which tells us about the foundation that is the elementary doctrine of Christ, and it is these things, repentance from dead works, faith toward God, instruction about washings, which is baptisms, laying on of hands, and resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. These are the six you know, foundations, uh, the elementary things, the principles of the doctrine of Jesus. And, um, you know, one of the things that I was hoping to do was to take a look in the book of Acts at various things, because it said about itself in Acts 5.20 that the Spirit spoke to Peter and said, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. It's telling me that the book of Acts records a lot of different things they said that were inspired by God. And it must be the case that they are sound examples of the fundamentals of the faith of Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. So that's what I was uh, you know, trying to do in this study and looking at these examples to try to see, does that principle hold up? Do we find um, that the the foundations of Hebrews 6, 1 and 2 are present in the sermons recorded in the book of Acts, in all the words of this life. And so one place that we look would be Acts 17, where Paul uh, addresses people in Athens. And you know, these are, well, they're not Jewish. Most of them are not even what you would call maybe proselyte. They, they, they've never heard of this before. They know nothing about God <clears throat> before Paul you know, comes and says these things to them. So it's the times of ignorance. And the apostle shows up with the message of God for them. which is recorded for us in the 22nd down to the 31st verses of Acts 17. Paul, standing in the middle of the Areopagus, that is Mars Hill, said, Men of Athens, I perceive in every way you're very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. He himself is the one who gives to all mankind life, breath, and everything they have. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all face of the earth, having determined a lot of periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he's actually not far from each one of us, for... In him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all people everywhere to repent because he's fixed a day on which he'll judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he's appointed. Of this, he's given assurance to all by raising that man from the dead. This is the entirety of the message that he was able to deliver. <laughs> well, the first thing we read in Hebrews 6 was repentance from dead works. Is that here? Well, if we look back at the first things uh, that he said, one of the things he said at verse 22 is, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. So you guys, you know, religion is important to you. I can tell. But it's also the case that he's bringing them something that isn't what they've been doing. It's different. What is that? That's repentance from dead works. What they've been doing has not been effective. Now it's time to be effective. That's how you get down there in the 30th verse the times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now commands all people everywhere to repent. 
So they are called upon to have that change of heart, that change of thought. They were living in all things very religious, but that's clearly not enough. They're called upon to repentance out of the times of ignorance. That's repentance from dead works. What they were doing was not effective. It was not accomplishing salvation in God. This is going to accomplish salvation. That's repentance. The other thing we read about in Hebrews 6 is faith towards God, that our trust is to be in Him, that we believe in God. Acts 17, verse 23 captures this. When he said to them, I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, and I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. So it's the case that they realized there might be a God they don't know. They haven't met. They, they don't know who it is. And there are um, archaeological finds about this. You know, this thing exists. And the prayers are basically they don't want this God that they don't know to be angry with them because they didn't know. That they tried to find him out. They hoped that he would make himself known to them. You know, these are the kinds of things that they were doing. And uh, I, I've heard a lot of people kind of mock this idea that it's just covering all the bases. In case we missed anybody, that's the catch-all. But I don't think so. I think if you're an honest person in ancient Greece and you know that the behavior of the Olympians is foul and nasty, then this has to be where you worship. Where else would you go? You know that there's something else out here that we, we don't know exactly what that is. I think the sincere people were worshiping there. I think that's why he called it out. And their prayer was to make God known to them. And here comes an apostle of Jesus Christ <laughs> who says, What you worship as unknown, this I now proclaim to you. So let's get this directed in the right way. He also said about God as he stood in the, in Mar, on the hill of Mars, hill of Ares, in the 25th verse, he is not served by human hands as though he needed anything. Faith towards God, as in, well, the trust has to be in him. He's the one who's strong. He's the one who gives. He's not served by, by us as though he were in need. It's the other way around. We need him. And the 27th verse the reason why he set us up in the places and times that we live in is so that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him, that is to say grope in the dark <laughs> and find him. And yet, he's actually not far from each one of us. So that faith towards God is saying we are set up to seek him. Yeah, maybe you didn't know him until now, but your desire to find him has its reward. And even, like he said, to grope in the dark, meaning you just will not be deterred. You will find God. If that's what you are doing in Athens and you're worshiping at the altar of the unknown God, your prayer has just been answered. That's what's happening. And he said, oh, actually, he's not far from each one of us. Now, in fact, the Greeks had their own poets, their own philosophers, who said these very things. These are quotations that were ancient at the time that Paul showed up. These were already centuries earlier. In him we live and move and have our being, at verse 28. We are indeed offspring of the divine. These are quotations from ancient times, from ancient philosophers, not all of whom believed in the Olympians, Famously, Socrates did not believe in the Olympians. One of the charges against him when they put him to death was he did not believe in the gods the city believes in. And that was correct. He did not believe in them. He was one of those philosophers who would say, we don't want to tell the Olympian stories to our children because we don't want our children to lie and cheat and murder and think it's okay. 
<laughs> so that's why they killed him, if you were wondering. That's why they killed him. A lot of philosophers would say things of this nature, and, he, and Paul has picked them and is quoting them, that what they said was true. We, in him, live and move and have our being. We are offspring from him, not from rocks or from Gaia. <laughs> we are from God. And in the 29th verse, since we are then the offspring of the, of the divine, We ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Once again, that's faith towards God. The truth of the being of God is not that he is formed by our imagination. We don't dictate the terms of God. He exists outside of us. We are looking for him. We depend upon him. This is all faith towards God. And again, at that 30th verse, remember he said, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all people everywhere to repent. And it's these times of ignorance that started back there in the 23rd verse to the unknown God. That's the same word, ignorant. Unknown is the God of which we are ignorant. These times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now commands all people everywhere to repent. What he's saying here is, that was the right way, in a sense, because the Olympians were clearly not right. That was the right way. But your question that, or your request that the unknown God make himself known to you has been answered. Now it's time to repent. That's what he's saying. But that faith is in God. You didn't know God. Now the one that you didn't know is known. He is now proclaimed to you. That's faith towards God, isn't it? And again, at the 30th verse, he did command all people everywhere to repent. So this is one of those places where you see in Acts, or I'm sorry, in Hebrews 6, it talked about instruction for washings or baptisms. And somebody might say, well, Paul didn't mention baptism in Acts 17. Well, okay. He didn't directly mention it as quoted here. But when you look at Acts 2.38, after they said to Peter, what shall we do? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. That's an and, <laughs> which means both of them. You got to do both. They're part and parcel. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. Why repent? For forgiveness when he says he commands all people everywhere to repent, it implies that baptism follows with that. One thing that's missing in Acts 17 is anybody saying, or you know, anybody about whom it is recorded, they were cut to the heart and said to the Apostle Paul, what do we do? If he had gotten that question, you would have seen Acts 2.38 repeated. That's not what happened there. But it's clear that it's part and parcel with this commandment for all people everywhere to repent. As for the laying on of hands in Hebrews 6, what is it talking about? Well, it means what you will touch and what you will not touch. What you go along with, what you approve of, who you run with. Sometimes known as fellowship. That's fine. And somebody will say, I thought fellowship was complicated. No, it's actually very simple. It's a fundamental principle of the faith. Acts 17, 24, the God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. This is a laying on of hands, not because they, we used our hands to make those temples, although that's true. What it's saying is God doesn't go along with us. We go along with him. We don't get to build something for him and put him in our little box, in our framing, in our way of thinking about what God is or does or should be or should say. We don't get to do that. It's not for us. We're not in control of that. What we lay hands on is God. 
He doesn't deign to live in the temples that we made up, in the forms that we made up, in the religions that we made up. We are reaching out to him. We want to come into fellowship with him. That means bringing ourselves into conformity to him. Also in Hebrews 6 is the resurrection from the dead. The fact that the dead are raised to live again, which is something that is explicitly stated in the 31st verse. God will judge the world by a man whom he has ordained. Of this he has given assurance to all people by raising that man from the dead. That is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is the, appointed to be the judge of all the world in righteousness. But he is the one who is raised from the dead, and this is the assurance God has given to all of the world. There is resurrection from the dead. There is life after this. There is coming a judgment, a reckoning after this world. And there is an eternal judgment, as Hebrews 6 talks about. It's the call here in the 30th and 31st verses of Acts 17. God overlooked these times of ignorance, but now commands all everywhere to repent because he's fixed a day on which he will judge the world. All people everywhere, on all the face of the earth, he had said earlier, he allotted us in our times and the boundaries of our dwelling. That is, wherever we live, in time or in space, that's all been predetermined by God so that we should seek the Lord. Everybody on all the face of the earth has a fixed day we are moving towards on which God judges in full justice. It'll be completely fair. That's the meaning of in righteousness. It's completely fair. It's not like before where somebody might say, well, we didn't know and there was no sign and we, you know, there were no prophets here. Or God was working with Israel and we didn't hear anything. Well, that's not exactly true. As we mentioned before, many of their prophets, many of their philosophers told them, Olympians can't be right. That can't be God. But even so, granted, they didn't have those things. But now they're called to repentance. Now it's fair because Jesus is proclaimed all over the world. The day of judgment is a fixed day, a day that we are moving towards. It's not like God is waiting for the right time to snap his finger and say, aha, now it's ripe, now it's ready. No, it's already determined. It's a time we don't know, but it's a time that God knows, and it's precise and it's fixed, and we're moving towards it. We're running out of time. Time is being spent. It's finite, and it's going away. <laughs> But this is an eternal judgment because a fixed day on which the world is judged is a fixed day on which time ceases to be. And that turns into a judgment that is without time. It's from then forward. That's existence. So yeah, I would say that all the elements of the fundamentals of the faith in Hebrews 6 are being applied just like the Holy Spirit said to the apostles, all the words of this life in Acts 5.20, everything that needed to be said was said. As, you know, as part of this study, um, you know, I, I've looked at several of the different sermons that were under this heading of all the words of this life. Um, and what I'm finding is that all the fundamentals are present in some form or other in all of these sermons, but that they're present in differing amounts with differing emphases. And if you take, you know, an account of what's there in Acts 7, I think the majority of it is faith towards God, which makes perfect sense when you're talking to a nation who knows nothing about God at all. They've never heard of, of God. They, they've never heard of Jesus. They do not have the scriptures. They know nothing. It makes perfect sense that the emphasis of the message to them would be faith towards God more than laying on of hands or instruction about baptism. 
that the the majority of that talk is about why God is the one in whom our faith should reside and what he's really like and not really like. That makes sense. When you look at other sermons in the Acts, you see different emphases, different aspects of Hebrews 6 uh, of those principles are being applied or uh, emphasized based on what you know who we're talking to and what, what their background is. And it all makes sense. But you do see all the elements present. That, that's what I found so far is they're all present in some form. So hopefully we can bring those and they'll be encouraging to you. Appreciate your kind attention. And if you haven't obeyed the gospel, it's time to obey the gospel. Perhaps till now God has spared your life, but none of us has a promise of tomorrow. It's time to repent and to obey God. If you haven't put Jesus on in baptism for forgiveness of sins, it's time to do so. We have water prepared that you might do it. But this is based upon your repentance, your change of heart to serve God from now on. Are you a Christian who had previously set your heart to seek the Lord but have since fallen away from these things? Well, repent. Pray God for forgiveness and let us pray with you for forgiveness that we might stand together and we might enter heaven together. If at this time you need the prayers of the saints or you need to obey the gospel, do not delay. Obey God before it's too late. Let your need in the Spirit be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected. <laughs>